First part of chapter 5 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Chapter 5. Nature Unified and Mind Discerned. Side note. Man's Feeble Grasp of Nature. When the mind has learned to distinguish external objects and to attribute to them a constant size, shape, and potency in spite of the variety and intermittence ruling in direct experience, there yet remains a great work to do before attaining a clear, even if superficial, view of the world. An animal's customary habitat may have constant features, and their relations in space may be learned by continuous exploration, but probably many other landscapes are also within the range of memory and fancy that stand in no visible relation to the place in which we find ourselves at a given moment. It is true that, at this day, we take it for granted that all real places, as we call them, lie in one space in which they hold definite geometric relations to one another and if we have glimpses of any region for which no room can be found in the single map of the universe which astronomy has drawn we unhesitatingly relegate that region to the land of dreams since the elysian fields and the coast of bohemia have no assignable latitude and longitude, we call these places imaginary, even if in some dream we remember to have visited them and dwelt there with no less sense of reality than in this single and geometrical world of commerce. It belongs to sanity and common sense, as men now possess them, to admit no countries unknown to geography and filling no part of the conventional space in three dimensions. All our waking experience is understood to go in some part of this space, and no court of law would admit evidence relating to events in some other sphere. This principle, axiomatic as it has become, is in no way primitive, since primitive experience is sporadic and introduces us to detached scenes separated by lapses in our senses and attention. These scenes do not hang together in any local contiguity. To construct a chart of the world is a difficult feat of synthetic imagination, not to be performed without speculative boldness and a heroic insensibility to the claims of fancy. Even now most people live without topographical ideas and have no clear conception of the spatial relations that keep together the world in which they move. They feel their daily way about, like animals, following a habitual scent, without dominating the range of their instinctive wanderings. Reality is rather a story to them than a system of objects and forces nor would they think themselves mad if at any time their experience should wander into a fourth dimension. Vague, dramatic and moral laws, when they find any causal application, seem to such dreaming minds more notable truths, deeper revelations of efficacious reality than the mechanical necessities of the case, which they scarcely conceive of and in this primordial prejudice they are confirmed by superstitious affinities often surviving in the religion and philosophy. In the midst of cities and affairs they are like landsmen at sea, incapable of an intellectual conception of their position, nor have they any complete confidence in their principles of navigation. They know the logarithms by root merely, and if they reflect, are reduced to a stupid wonder, and only half believe they are in a known universe, or will ever reach an earthly port. It would not require superhuman eloquence in some prophetic passenger to persuade them 
to throw compass and quadrant overboard and steer enthusiastically for El Dorado. The theory of navigation is essentially as speculative as that of salvation, only it has survived more experiences of the judgment and repeatedly brought those who trust in it to their promised land. Side note. Its unity ideal and discoverable only by steady thought. The theory that all real objects and places lie together in one even and homogeneous space, conceived as similar in its constitution to the parts of extension of which we have immediate intuition, is a theory of the greatest practical importance and validity. By its light we carry on all our affairs, and the success of our action, while we rely upon it, is the best proof of its truth. The imaginative parsimony and discipline which such a theory involves are balanced by the immense extension and certitude it gives to knowledge. It is at once an act of allegiance to nature and a magna charta which mind imposes on the tyrannous world, which in turn pledges itself before the assembled faculties of man not to exceed its constitutional privilege and to harbor no magic monsters in unattainable lairs from which they might issue to disturb human labors. Yet that spontaneous intelligence which first enabled men to make this genial discovery and take so fundamental a step toward taming experience should not be laid by after this first victory. It is a weapon needed in many subsequent conflicts. To conceive that all nature makes one system is only a beginning. The articulation of natural life has still to be discovered in detail, and, what is more, a similar articulation has to be given to the psychic world which now, by the very act that constitutes nature and makes her consistent, appears at her side, or rather in her bosom. That the unification of nature is eventual and theoretical is a point useful to remember. Else the relation of the natural world to poetry, metaphysics, and religion will never become intelligible. Lalande, or whoever it was, who searched the heavens with his telescope and could find no god, would not have found the human mind if he had searched the brain with a microscope. Yet God existed in man's apprehension long before mathematics or even perhaps before the vault of heaven, for the objectification of the whole mind with its passion and motives naturally precedes that abstraction by which the idea of a material world is drawn from the chaos of experience an abstraction which culminates in such atomic and astronomical theories as science is now familiar with. The sense for life in things, be they small or great, is not derived from the abstract idea of their bodies, but is an ancient concomitant to that idea, inseparable from it until it became abstract. Truth and materiality, mechanism and ideal interests are collateral projections from one rolling experience which shows up one aspect or the other as it develops various functions and dominates itself to various ends. When one ore is abstracted and purified, the residuum subsists in that primeval quarry in which it originally lay, the failure to find God among the stars, or even the attempt to find him there, does not indicate that human experience affords no avenue to the idea of God, for history proves the contrary, but indicates rather the atrophy in this particular man of the imaginative faculty by which his race had attained to that idea. 
such an atrophy might indeed become general, and God would in that case disappear from human experience as music would disappear if universal deafness attacked the race. Such an event is made conceivable by the loss of allied imaginative habits, which is observable in historic times. Yet possible variations in human faculty do not involve the illegitimacy of such faculties as actually subsist, and the abstract world known to science, unless it dries up the ancient fountains of ideation by its habitual presence in thought, does not remove those parallel dramatizations or abstractions which experience may have suggested to men. What enables men to perceive the unity of nature is the unification of their own wills. A man half asleep without fixed purposes, without intellectual keenness or joy in recognition, might graze about like an animal, forgetting each satisfaction in the next and banishing from his frivolous mind the memory of every sorrow. What had just failed to kill him would leave him as thoughtless and unconcerned as if it had never crossed his path. Such irrational elasticity and innocent improvidence would never put two and two together. Every morning there would be a new world with the same fool to live in it. But let some sobering passion, some serious interest, lend perspective to the mind, and a point of reference will immediately be given for protracted observation. Then the laws of nature will begin to dawn upon thought. Every experiment will become a lesson, every event will be remembered as favourable or unfavourable to the master passion. At first, indeed, this keen observation will probably be animistic, and the laws discovered will be chiefly habits, human or divine, special favours or envious punishments and warnings. But the same constancy of aim which discovers the dramatic conflicts composing society and tries to read nature in terms of passion will, if it be long sustained, discover behind this glorious chaos a deeper mechanical order. Men's thoughts, like the weather, are not so arbitrary as they seem, and the true master in observation the man guided by a steadfast and superior purpose will see them revolving about their centers in obedience to quite calculable instincts, and the principle of all their flutterings will not be hidden from his eyes. Belief in indeterminism is a sign of indetermination. No commanding or steady intellect flirts with so miserable a possibility which, in so far as it actually prevailed, would make virtue impotent and experience, in its pregnant sense, impossible. Side note. Mind the erratic residue of existence. We have said that those objects which cannot be incorporated into the one space which the understanding envisages are relegated to another sphere called imagination. We reach here a most important corollary. As material objects making a single system which fills space and evolves in time are conceived by abstraction from the flux of sensuous experience, so, pari passu, the rest of experience, with all its other outgrowths and concretions, falls out with the physical world and forms the sphere of mind, the sphere of memory, fancy, and the passions. We have in this discrimination the genesis of mind, not of course in the transcendental sense in which the word mind is extended to mean the sum total and mere fact of existence, for mind, so taken, can have no origin and indeed no specific meaning, but the genesis of mind as a determinate form of being, 
a distinguishable part of the universe known to experience and discourse, the mind that unravels itself in meditation inhabits animal bodies and is studied in psychology. Mind, in this proper sense of the word, is the residue of existence, the leavings, so to speak, and parings of experience when the material world has been cut out of the whole cloth. Reflection underlines in the chaotic continuum of sense and longing those aspects that have practical significance. It selects the efficacious ingredients in the world. The trustworthy object which is thus retained in thought, the complex of connected events, is nature, and though so intelligible an object is not soon nor vulgarly recognized because human reflection is pertube and halting, yet every forward step in scientific and practical knowledge is a step toward its clearer definition. At first much parasitic matter clings to that dynamic skeleton. Nature is drawn like a sponge heavy and dripping from the waters of sentience. It is soaked with inefficacious passions and overlaid with idle accretions. Nature, in a word, is at first conceived mythically, dramatically, and retains much of the unintelligible sporadic habit of animal experience itself. But as attention awakes and discrimination, practically inspired, grows firm and stable, irrelevant qualities are stripped off, and the mechanical process, the efficacious infallible order, is clearly disclosed beneath. Meantime the incidental effects, the secondary qualities, are relegated to a personal inconsequential region. They constitute the realm of appearance, the realm of mind. End of chapter 5, part 1